Will Christians soon disappear? Raptured before seven years of tribulation, when the Antichrist makes war against the Jews? Jesus Christ gave this special warning about the last days. Take heed that no one deceives you. Join us now as seminar speaker Steve Wahlberg presents Antichrist Delusions. The book of Revelation says, the time is at hand. Thank you for coming, for joining us for part three of this uh, very controversial series called End Time Delusions. Woodrow Wilson once said, most people stumble over truth at least once in their lives, but usually they get up and they go on. And I'm hoping that today as we study our Bibles and as we take a close look at truth, that we will not just get up and go on, but that we will follow it wherever it leads. So I invite you to open your Bibles to the book of 1 John, 1 John chapter, chapter 2, and this is uh, Little John, there's Big John, the Gospel of John, then there's three Little Johns before the book of Revelation, if you're not that familiar with the Bible, and we're going to look at 1 John chapter 2, verse 1, in just a little bit after I uh, pray and after we get a little introduction to what we're going to be talking about. This is a really big subject. I definitely feel the weight of this. And I invite you to uh, join me as we bow our heads and as we talk to God and invite his presence. Dear Heavenly Father, Father, in the name of Jesus, we pray and we ask that you will come, that you will be with us, that your power will be here, that the Holy Spirit will uh, clarify truth and that you will help us to understand your word. Please guide this seminar, we pray, in Jesus Christ's holy name. Amen. Okay, here we go. Uh, the title of today's talk, talk, topic, message is called Antichrist. Uh, this is part three. When most people and most Christians today think about the subject of Antichrist, they generally speaking think about one person, one uh, super bad guy, ha a half man, half devil type of a person who's going to show up at the very end of time and then just take over the world. Mr. Sinister, Mr. Evil, Mr. Diabolical. This is the popular view of the Antichrist. This view is, is perfectly illustrated in the best-selling series of books, the New York Times best-selling series called Left Behind. I've talked about this in the last couple of uh, programs here as we've gone into our end time delusion subject. Left behind is, is swirling all around the subject of the Antichrist. In the first book of Left Behind, all the Christians disappear, they vanish, they're taken up to heaven, and then shortly thereafter, this man rises up, this evil man. He looks like a nice guy, he's really a bad guy. His name in the series is called Nikolai Carpathia. If you see on the screen there, you'll see three books. The third book over on the right is called Nikolai, and this is all about this man. Really, he is the Antichrist. He's the fictional version of what a lot of people believe. And there you see a picture on the screen of the actor that played Nikolai Carpathia in uh, the Left Behind movie. And again, when, if you ever watch the movie or if you read the books, this person is portrayed as someone that is uh, super sinister, totally evil. Uh, he's a manifestation of the devil, although most people don't know that because he looks like Mr. Nice Guy, but he's really uh, Mr. Evil. Now, again, this is just fiction. Uh, everybody knows Left Behind is fiction, but still, it still portrays the common view of what the Antichrist will be like or what they think he'll be like. And because a lot of Christians, including me, and probably most of you, uh, sense that we are definitely getting closer to the coming of Jesus Christ, to the final days, what's happening is more and more Christians are starting to look around. They're starting to look at different people around the world and they're trying to possibly, you know, guess who it might be. Who could this sinister antichrist, uh, you know, maybe he's here now. And so they're starting to, uh, to speculate. If you go on, onto the internet and type in the word antichrist like I did, this is going to shock you and it's, it's actually pretty funny. But you'll find a website out there that suggests the possibility that this man, David Hasselhoff, could be the Antichrist. And this is actually a spoof of a website. Uh, I don't know how many of you are familiar with David. He's, a, he's European, he's from Germany, and he starred in the big uh, major mega series called uh, Baywatch. 
And this particular website says that, look, David comes out of the Pacific Ocean, you know, and, and the Bible says the beast rises up out of the sea, so he's just a perfect fit. And they give a whole lot of other reasons why they think that, that David might be the Antichrist. Now, there are other websites and other guesses of people that are, are not quite so funny, such as Mikhail Gorbachev. There are many people that wonder whether he might be the Antichrist. There's a, there's a number of ministries and, and actually authors, major authors, that are talking about Gorbachev. And, and I've heard some people say that, that because he has a birthmark on his forehead, that that might be the Lord's way of giving uh, God's people sort of a preliminary uh, insight into the fact that this man might become the Antichrist and enforce the mark of the beast. That's, that's a view that is out there. Now, here's another one, Bill Gates. Some people think that Bill Gates might be the Antichrist because he is Mr. Technology. And there's no question that when the mark of the beast is finally enforced at the end of time, that technology will definitely play a major role. And so people speculate, they wonder, maybe it's, maybe it's Bill Gates. Maybe he's the, the evil one predicted in the Bible. Here's another, another suggestion. Prince Charles, I don't know if you've heard of this or not, but there's actually a book out called The Antichrist and a, and a Cup of Tea by Tim Cohen. And this book gives a lot of reasons. And this is not a, a, a fiction book. This is nonfiction. It's very serious. It goes into all the different reasons why this particular author thinks that really this, he fits. He's perfect. He, he has all the characteristics. And so this person thinks that uh, Prince Charles could be or will be the Antichrist. So there's a lot of suspected Antichrists out there. And again, people are starting to look around. They're starting to guess. And the reason why they're doing that is because they're convinced that Antichrist, according to the Bible, is one super sinister bad guy uh, who's going to show up at the end. I, I remember some time ago I was in Texas and I was getting my hair cut when I, I used to live in Texas and I got into a conversation with a lady that was cutting my hair and we started talking about the Antichrist and I told her that we were doing a series on this. We did a, a similar one in Texas. And she said, do you think the Antichrist is here right now? Who do you think it is? Do you think he's uh, you know, some politician? Well, we had quite an interesting discussion. And as we go on today, I'll, I'll explain more of what I believe about the Antichrist. And I'm going to do it from this book. I'm not going to guess. I'm not going to speculate. I'm not just going to be like some magician and pull an interpretation out of my hat. But I'm going to take a look at the Bible because that's what we need to do. Wouldn't you agree? There's a lot of speculation out there. There's a lot of different uh, opinions. Somebody once said, quote, what is popular is not always right. And what is right is not always popular. Good line, extremely good line, especially when we think about how 2,000 years ago, uh, Mr. Right, Mr. Truth came into the world, Jesus Christ, and he was finally crucified. So that tells us that what is right is uh, definitely not always popular. And so let's take a look at what the Bible actually says about this subject of Antichrist. If you're taking notes, or if you're not, that's okay, but if you are, you might wanna jot this down that the word antichrist, that specific word is used five times in the Bible. That's it. And all of them are in 1 John and 2 John. 1 John and 2 John. And we're going to take a look at all of those verses uh, very quickly. But before we actually look at the first verse about antichrist, I want to take a look at 1 John chapter 2, verse 1, because this verse talks about, about Jesus Christ. And my, my deepest conviction, this is a very important point, is that the only way that we can ever really uh, comprehend what the Bible teaches about anti-Christ is if we really understand and believe in Jesus Christ. Because anti-Christ is only anti-Christ in the light of Jesus Christ. Doesn't that make sense? So we have to understand Christ. We have to know what Jesus is all about, what is the truth of Christ, and then we are prepared to understand anti-Christ. So the first text, 1 John chapter 2, verse 1. John wrote these words about 2,000 years ago. He said, my little children, and he wasn't writing to little, little kids, he was writing to the church, and he called them little children because they were supposed to have a humble, trusting attitude toward God and the Bible. My little children, these things I write to you, John said, so that you may not sin. God's plan is that we don't sin. Sin is what has gotten us into all the problems in this world. 
Anybody have any problems out there? I mean, we all have problems, and, and the root cause of all the problems of this world is sin. And God does not want us to sin. Sin is a disaster. But if we do sin, we have hope. And that's what the rest of the verse says. It says, if anyone does sin, John said, we have, and what do we have? He said, we have an advocate. Now, the word advocate basically means a defense attorney. It means a lawyer. We have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ, the righteous. Now, when John says here, the Father, who's he talking about? Is he talking about your dad or, your, or uh, you know, some, some spiritual relative of yours? Is he talking about uh, a priest? No, in this verse, he's talking about the Father in heaven. He said, we have an advocate with the Father, and that advocate is Jesus Christ, the righteous. And John begins this chapter focusing on Christ as our advocate. In other words, if we do sin, which the Bible says we've all sinned at some point in our lives, the whole world has sinned. If we sin, uh, the Scripture says that we can go to our advocate, who is Jesus Christ, the righteous one. He lived a perfectly righteous life, and he stands up there before the Father in our behalf. And then the, if you keep on going, it tells us more about Jesus. Verse 2 says, He himself is the propitiation for our sins. And the word pro propitiation, that's a technical theological word, but it really means our sacrifice. He, Jesus is, he himself is the propitiation or the sacrifice for our sins, and not for ours only, but also for how many people? For the sins of the whole world. Now, there are some people that believe that Jesus only died for a few. But this verse says that Jesus died for the sins of the whole world. Uh, that is very, very clear. So not only is he our advocate, but he's also our sacrifice. In other words, Christ is a complete savior. So if we've sinned, Jesus is the full and perfect sacrifice for all of our sins, however many sins we've committed, for the sins of the whole world. And then he's up there right now before the Father as our advocate. So he can forgive our sins because of his sacrifice, and he can apply his perfect life to us, his righteousness to us, as our advocate. In other words, Jesus is all that we need. Hallelujah. He's everything that we need. Uh, we don't need anybody else, really, as far as, as salvation goes, other than the Lord Jesus Christ. He's perfect. He's everything. His death is sufficient for the whole world. And that's, that is the truth of Jesus Christ. That's the way John starts out this chapter. Now, let's go down to the 18th verse. Now that we know about Jesus Christ, and there's, of course, a whole lot more that could be said, now we are prepared to talk about Antichrist. 1 John 2, verse 18. This is the first verse, the first phrase where that word is used. The 18th verse. John said, Little children, it is the last hour. And as you have heard that Antichrist shall come, then he said, even now are there, and what's that next word? There are many what? Many Antichrists, whereby we know that it is the last hour. And this is the first time the word Antichrist is used, and Paul, or uh, John uses it twice in this verse. And he says, you've heard to the early church that Antichrist is coming, and then he said, even now, even now are there many Antichrists. When most people think of that word Antichrist, uh, they only think of one. But John said, there's many. When most people think of Antichrist, they think of one coming in the future at the end. But John said, even now, are there many Antichrists? And this is how we know we're in the last time. And John wrote this 2,000 years ago. So, so far, based upon our, our Bibles, we know there's not just one. There are many, and they are here now, right? That's what our Bible says. Let's separate the facts from the fiction and look at the Scripture. Now, go down to verse 19. Verse 19 is shocking. Look at it carefully. Verse 19, John said, they, they, now when he said they, who's he talking about? Who is the they? They, right, applies to these many antichrists. He said they went out from, and what's that next word? 
They went out from us, right? They went out from us. And who is the us? Who does us apply to? It applies to Christians, right? It applies to, uh, John is talking about himself and the leadership in the early Christian church. And so when John wrote here that these many antichrists, they went out from us, he's revealing a principle here that these many antichrists come out from within the Christian church. If you were the devil, or if you wanted to be antichrist, uh, where would be the most deceptive place for you to go? Would you hang out in a bar, or would you try to get into the church? You try to get into the church. And this verse, here's the, uh, this is the second verse, or the first verse right above it, second time the word antichrist is used. John is laying a foundation, and he says that they come out from within uh, Christianity. They, they look like Christians, but they're not. They're, they're actually deceivers. They put on a Christian face, but they are led by, by the devil, by Satan himself, by the enemy. Now let's keep going. Go down to verse 22. 1 John 2, 22. John continued, who is a liar, but he who denies that Jesus is the Christ. He is anti-Christ who denies the Father and the Son. So here's something else about Antichrist. Whoever denies the Father, and, and who's the Father? Who's he talking about? He's talking about God, God our Father. And then who denies the Son, and Jesus is the only way to the Father. He said, I'm the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father but by me. And John says that Antichrist is going to deny the Father and the Son. Now, he doesn't do it openly and obviously. He does it uh, in a subtle way. In fact, if you go down to verse 26, John continued and said, these things I have written to you concerning those who try to deceive you or seduce you, some Bibles say. And this is talking about these many antichrists, that they're, they're subtle, they're deceptive, they're tricky. Uh, they come from the inside and they subtly try to lead people away from the Father and from the Son, who's the only uh, advocate and our, and our full sacrifice. That's what John is saying. That's, that's the context here. Now, if you go to chapter 4, verse 3, here we have the fourth reference to the word antichrist. 1 John 4, verse 3. John said, Every spirit that does not confess that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh is not of God, but this is that spirit of what? This is that spirit of Antichrist. So Antichrist is not just applied to different people, but this verse says there is, there's even a spirit of Antichrist. Antichrist is big, it's a big subject, and there's a spirit of Antichrist, and, and when does the spirit come? If you look at the rest of the verse, John said, which you have heard was coming, just like he already said in the previous verse, you've heard Antichrist is coming. And then he said, and even now, already is it in the world. So according to John, Antichrist, many Antichrists, and the spirit of Antichrist, it's here now. It's already in the world according to this verse. Now go down to verse 4, 1 John 4, 4. Who is supposed to deal with Antichrist? Who is supposed to overcome Antichrist? Verse 4, John said to the church and to Christians, he said, you are of God, little children, and you have overcome them. And who is the them? The them is these, these many Antichrists. You have overcome them because greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. Greater is he who is in you than he that's in the world. Praise the Lord. Uh, this verse is saying that no matter how powerful or how subtle Antichrist and the spirit of Antichrist is, God's power is greater. And if God's power is in us, greater is the one who is in us than he who's in the world. And so based upon this verse, who is it that's supposed to, to discern and do battle with and overcome many Antichrists and the spirit of Antichrist? Who is it? It's Christians. It's you, it's me. Now some people, their theology today tells, tells them that Christians have nothing to do with Antichrist. They say that it's only after we're gone that Antichrist shows up because Antichrist can't show up while the church is in the world. That's what people say, that's what some people teach. But this verse is telling us no. This verse is telling us that it's Christians here now. 
we're the ones that have to deal with and we're the ones by the grace of God and through the power of God that must overcome Antichrist. And who else could do it? I mean, who else can overcome Antichrist but spirit-filled Christians who have the power of Jesus Christ in their lives? Nobody else except for true believers. Now, let's look at one more verse in, in John. Let's go to 2 John, the little book of 2 John. Just turn the page, a couple pages. 2 John, here's the fifth reference to the word Antichrist. It's in verse 7. 2 John 7. John wrote, for many, and what's that next word? Deceivers, many deceivers have gone out into the world who do not confess that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh. This is a deceiver and an antichrist. So based upon this verse, again, is there only one antichrist? Is there only one based upon this verse? No. There, he says there's many that have gone out into the world. And what does he call them? He calls them deceivers. And that, again, tells us that that antichrist is a word that applies to things that are subtle, things that are tricky, deceivers, seducers, tricksters. There's a lot of them. They've gone out into the world, and they are trying to lead subtly away from the truth of Jesus Christ. That's what we've read in 1 John and 2 John. We've looked up all five references to the word antichrist, and what have we found? This is what we learned just from studying our Bibles, not from listening to uh, any speculation, but just reading the good book ourselves, which I've done and which now you have seen. We have learned that there are many antichrists. We've learned that they are deceptive and tricky and subtle. We've learned that they come from within the church and try to lead people astray. We've learned that they are here now and we've learned that Christians, true Christians, must do battle with them and overcome them through the power of God. Isn't that right? That's what we've learned. That's the foundation that we have learned from First and Second John. Now, there are other passages in the books of Daniel and Revelation. Although they don't use the word specifically antichrist, uh, Daniel talks about a little horn that is definitely antichrist that we're going to be looking at uh, very shortly. Paul in Second Thessalonians 2 talked about something called the mystery of lawlessness and that wicked, which is definitely antichrist. And then in the book of Revelation, there's something called the beast, this beast that rises up out of the sea, which is not David Hasselhoff, but something else. But anyway, uh, Revelation talks about this, Paul talks about this, Daniel talks about this, and most scholars are pretty clear on the fact that these uh, references in the prophecies are definitely referring to something that is antichrist, even though the word specifically is not used. Now here's my question. If the only times in the Bible when the word is used is in 1 John and 2 John, and we've learned that there's many, they come from within, they're subtle and they're deceptive and that they, it applies to something that Christians have to overcome, would it make any sense when, when you go to Daniel and Revelation that talks about the horn and the beast and this uh, mystery of iniquity, which is definitely antichrist, that the prophecies would shift gears away from the foundation that's been laid in the Bible and then talk about something that is from the outside of the church and something that Christians have nothing to do with and don't have to do battle with. Would that make any sense? Would it make sense for the prophecies to completely move in a different direction from the direction that has been laid in First and Second John? Uh, I don't think so. And as we keep on going, I think it's going to be very, very clear uh, what this is talking about. Let's go to the book of Daniel, Daniel chapter 7. Daniel is the, the parallel to the book of Revelation. It's basically the revelation of the Old Testament. Daniel chapter 7, let's take a look at this. And we don't have time to go into all the details. And if you want to do a lot more study on this, I want to recommend this book, End Time Delusions. End Time Delusions deals with all of this history. There's a whole section on Antichrist, all these issues. Everything I'm saying to you today is inside this book, plus a whole lot more, a whole lot more. So we're going to look at Daniel 7, then we're going to talk about some history, and then we're going to continue and talk about the, the big battle that is actually going on right in front of our eyes if we have eyes to see it and to understand a spiritual discernment of really what's going on around us. So Daniel chapter 7, let's do a little bit of study here as we build up 
to what Daniel says about the little horn. Daniel 7, verse 1. Daniel was in, in Babylon. He had a dream. The Bible says, In the first year of Belshazzar, the king of Babylon, Daniel had a dream and visions of his head while upon his bed. He wrote down the dream, telling the main facts. In verse 3, in his dream, he saw four great what? Four great beasts, and they rose up. They rose up from the sea, four of them, each different from the other. Verse 4 says the first was like what kind of an animal? Like a lion, right? And it had eagle's wings. And then in verse 5, suddenly another beast, a second one, like what kind of an animal? Like a bear, right? And the bear rose up, and it had three ribs in its mouth, and a word was given to it to, de- to arise and devour much flesh. In verse 6, Daniel said, After this I looked in my dream, and he said, There was another beast. And what, did it, what, what kind of an animal was it like? It was like a leopard, right? A leopard that had four heads and four wings. Verse 7, After this I saw in the night visions, and behold, a fourth beast, dreadful and terrible and exceedingly strong. It had huge iron teeth. It was devouring, breaking in pieces, and trampling the residue with its feet. It was different from all the beasts that were before it, and it had ten horns. So here we have four beasts. We have a lion, we have a bear, we have a leopard, we have a dragon, or a dragon-like beast, some beast that really Daniel didn't exactly know what to call it. He'd probably seen some lions in his day. He might have seen some bears. He might have seen some leopards, but he had never seen anything like this fourth beast. So here we have in in prophecy, I, I often call this God's prophetic zoo. God's zoo. Now, obviously, uh, these beasts are symbols of something. We can't expect real beasts like this to be rising up out of the Pacific Ocean or the Atlantic Ocean of the, or the Mediterranean Sea. Now, the next question is, in order to understand this, uh, we have to know what a beast represents in prophecy. What is a beast? Some people think the beast is a, the beast is a big computer in Belgium. Have you ever heard that idea? Big computer. Uh, other people, of course, most people think the beast in the book of Revelation is this super bad guy. It's this half man, half devil like Nikolai Carpathia in the Left Behind series. But what does the Bible say? Just like we read First and Second John and we learned some new things, what does the Bible say a beast represents? That's what we have to find out. And I'm not just going to pick an interpretation out of my hat and speculate. We can't afford to speculate. We're going to look at it right here in the book. So turn to uh, verse 23, and an angel actually explains what a beast represents. In verse 23, in Daniel's dream, The Bible says, thus he said, this is an angel talking to Daniel, thus he said, the fourth beast shall be the fourth computer upon the earth. Is that right? Is the fourth beast a fourth computer? Is the fourth beast a fourth man? What is the fourth beast? Right. The fourth beast shall be the fourth kingdom upon the earth. So if the fourth beast is the fourth kingdom, then the third beast would be what? The third kingdom, and the second beast would be the second kingdom, and the first beast would be the first kingdom. And so we know according to the angel, not according to Steve Wahlberg, not according to any church, but according to the angel of God in Daniel's dream, the angel said that these different beasts represent represent kingdoms. And I would say 90 8% of all Bible scholars uh, throughout Christian history and even before that who have studied this particular chapter, just about all of them are in agreement about who these four beasts are. What nation was Daniel in when he had the dream? He was in Babylon, right? And if you go to, uh, to Germany, there is a museum there called the Pergamum Museum, and I've been there. And what is there is a reconstruction of some of the ruins of the ancient city of Babylon. Somebody went to Babylon to the ruins. They brought some of the ruins back to the Pergamon Museum and they reconstructed them. And you can go there and you can see the procession way that went right through the Ishtar Gate into Babylon and you can see all kinds of uh, images of winged lions. That a winged lion was a symbol of ancient Babylon. It's a historical fact. 
And just about all scholars have recognized that that winged lion represented Babylon. And what was the nation that conquered Babylon? It was Persia, Medo-Persia. And what was the nation that conquered Greece? Or that conquered, uh, there you go, <laughs> that conquered the leopard? It was Greece, right. Uh, Alexander the Great, he, and he was very fast. He conquered the world in eight years for, in the name of Greece, the, the Macedonian prince. This is basic history, and I think that's why God represented Greece as a leopard, because it was very fast. And then what nation, what fourth nation, conquered Greece? It was Rome. That's right, the, the, the Roman Empire, which was the greatest and most powerful of all the nations that were, that were before it. And again, just about all scholars recognize Babylon, Persia, Greece, and Rome. It perfectly fits this prophecy. And there you see on the screen there. Now let's go back to Daniel. And let's take a look again at the seventh verse. At the end of verse seven, when it talks about that fourth beast, that terrible strong beast, which represents the Roman Empire, no question about it, it says at the end, it had how many horns? It had 10 horns, right, 10 horns. And what happened when, when the Roman Empire fell, it was divided among various nations, 10 nations in Western Europe. Now then, if you keep going, in verse eight, Daniel says, I was considering the horns, I was looking at those 10 horns that came out of the fourth beast, the Roman Empire. And behold, there came up, and what came up? He said, there came up another horn another horn, a little one, coming up among them before whom there were three of the first horns plucked up by the roots. And there in this horn there were eyes, like the eyes of a man and a mouth speaking great things. So here comes this 11th horn. It comes up out of the fourth beast. It comes up among the 10 horns. And as Daniel's looking at it, he sees eyes in it, he sees it has a mouth speaking, speaking great things. And just about all scholars recognize that whoever or whatever this is, their interpretations differ, differ, but just about everybody recognizes that this horn is anti-Christ. It's something anti-Christ, whoever or whatever, whatever it is. Now go down to verse 21 and take a look at another characteristic of this horn. Verse 21 says, I was watching... Daniel said in his dream, I was watching and the same horn, what was it doing? It was making war against the saints and prevailing against them. So this is a characteristic of the horn. Now if you put the characteristics together, and there are others, we're not gonna look, at, look up all of them, but there you can see on the screen, one characteristic we know is it has eyes like a man. Now this text does not say that this horn will be just one man, does it? It doesn't say that. It says it would have eyes like a man. And then it also says, we already read, in verse eight, that it would have a mouth speaking great things, making, making great claims for itself. This is a very proud and self-exalted horn. And then we already read in verse 21 that we know that this horn eventually is going to be a persecuting horn, right? It's going to make war on who? Who's it gonna make war on? It says it will make war on the saints, right? The saints of God. That's very, very significant. And it, it says that it would even overcome them at some point in history. So these are some of, the, some of the pieces. It would come out of the fourth beast, which represented what nation? Roman Empire. It would rise up among the ten horns, which represented the division of the Roman Empire. And then it would have a mouth speaking great things, eyes like a man, some kind of a human eyesight going on there, and then it would also eventually make war against the saints. Now, you might need to hold on to your seats, your seat belts, put your seat belts on. Sometimes when I cover up big subjects, I tell my audience, I say, you need to put your seat belts on. Sometimes I tell them when we talk about certain topics, I say, don't miss this next meeting because that's a five seat belt subject. Or don't miss this meeting, this is an eight seat belt subject. And every once in a while, I even have a 10 seat belt subject. Well, this is one of those, one of those seat belt subjects. 
I'm going to share with you some history, some very, very significant history that many people have just lost sight of. Uh, but it's very real, it happened, and we need to understand it, especially in the light, in the light of Bible prophecy. So here we go. One of the most powerful movements in the history of Christianity was called the Protestant Reformation. Have you heard of it? Most of you have. The Protestant Reformation, it took place in the 1500s. It started a little bit early in the 1400s, went on into the 1500s, and it was uh, led by certain individuals that were, were men of God who were willing to stand up for truth and even to die for their faith. People like John Wycliffe, who lived in the 1400s, the latter part of the 1400s, and he was one of the first to translate the Bible into, into English. He was an Englishman. And then there, were, there was Martin Luther. And so uh, Martin Luther, he was really the main one that's, that gave birth to the Reformation, following in the footstep, footsteps of Wycliffe. And Luther's preaching led to the development of the Lutheran church, to the starting of the Lutheran church. And then there was John Calvin, the Presbyterian, Calvin in Geneva, in Switzerland, Calvin's ministry. And then there was later on John Wesley who founded the Methodist Church. And there were others like Huss and uh, Melanchthon and Jerome. And the list goes on and on and on and on and on of uh, Protestants who rose up in the 1400s and the 1500s to, to preach and teach from the Bible. Now, the, what really got the, the Protestant Reformation going was really uh, an event took place in the year 1450. Anybody remember what happened in 1450? The man's name was Gutenberg. Gutenberg invented the printing press. 1450, it was a milestone year. And the first book off the press was guess what book? It was the Bible. That's right, this is the first book ever printed with movable type. And what happened was, I'll just give you some history behind this, what happened in the, in the 1400s and then into the 1500s was Bibles began to be printed and uh, copied by hand, and they began to circulate around Europe and into England. And what happened was people began to read Bibles for the first time in their lives. They'd never read the Bible before, and they started reading. And as they read, they started reading the Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, and they discovered the powerful good news about Jesus Christ our advocate, our sacrifice, who died for all of our sins and who was the only way to the Father. They discovered this and, and they fell in love with Christ. They discovered the good news. And as they did that, as they read the Bible and as they looked at, at the church, they discovered that a lot of traditions had come into Christianity, many, many traditions that were actually taking the eyes of people off of Jesus Christ. People were having to work their way to heaven. They had to do all kinds of things to get to heaven. And there were all kinds of traditions. And they couldn't go directly to the Father through Jesus Christ. They had to go through priests and, and through the Pope and through the church and through the saints. And people realized as they read the Bible that they don't need to do this. They can just go directly to the Father through Jesus Christ. That's what happened. And they were, they were so uh, moved by this that they wanted to reform the church, which was predominantly at that time, the major church was the Roman Catholic Church, centered in Rome. That was the, the mother church. And they, these people, most of them were Catholics, and they tried to reform the church. They wanted to get people back to the Bible, back to Jesus. Well, what happened was uh, they experienced fierce opposition for their preaching, which was not expected. And as time went on, they went back to their Bibles and then they began to study the prophecies. They began to study Daniel, 2 Thessalonians 2, and they began to study the book, the book of Revelation. Luther did this, Calvin did this, Jerome did this, Huss did this, Wycliffe did this. Many of the Protestant reformers did this. Wesley did this later on. And as they began to study the Bible, Lo and behold, they began to put the pieces together. They went to Daniel 7. They read about the lion, Babylon, Persia, Greece, Rome, the Roman Empire. 
the Roman Empire falling. They saw the ten horns representing the breakdown of the Roman Empire and the nations that were established in Europe that came from the north, the Germanic tribes. And they saw this. And then they read about that little horn coming right up, right there out of the Roman Empire, among the ten horns, right in Europe. That would get start small but get bigger and bigger and bigger. Would have eyes like a man, human leadership. Would have a mouth saying great things, making great claims for itself. And then eventually this little horn began to make war on the saints. And they saw this right in their Bibles. And so one by one, the Protestant reformers, as they put, looked at the Bible and put the pieces together, they realized that that little horn was right in front of them. That it was the, it was the papal power. It was the institution of the Vatican centered in Rome. Now they, they were Catholics themselves. And so I don't believe this applies to uh, the people themselves, but more the system, the papal system centered in Rome as, as an institution uh, centered in the popes. And they saw this. And then they realized that all the pieces fit together and there's a famous Protestant saying. And the word Protestant, many people don't know this, but you know what the word Protestant really means? It means protest. Protestants, they protested against the church and wanted to get people back to the Bible. And once they studied prophecy, then there's a famous Protestant saying, and this is what it is, that the Protestant reformers, in the blazing light of Jesus Christ, they discovered Antichrist. They discovered Jesus Christ and Antichrist right in front of them. They saw Christ, then they saw a power that was leading away from Christ, and then they identified it as Antichrist that came right up from within the church. It was subtle, it was deceptive, it was working right there, and they had to do battle with it, just like the principles that were in the book of 1 John. Same thing, and 2 and John. Here's a quotation uh, that appeared in 1999. This was just a few years ago in Newsweek. Uh, this was a particular issue right before Y2K that dealt with prophetic theories that were current in the religious world. Uh, this fascinating issue, and it says there, you can see it right on the screen, November 1, 1999, page 72, that Martin Luther was the first to identify the papacy as such with the Antichrist. Now, this is not exactly accurate. He really wasn't the first, but he was one of the main ones in the 1500s. And then it says that this was a view that was to become dogma for all Protestant churches. Now, this is right there in Newsweek. I mean, I didn't write this. This is just based on, based on history that this became the teaching of the major Protestant churches and the major Protestant reformers for 400 years. Here's another quote from Daubigny. He's the classic Protestant historian who wrote uh, the history of the Reformation of the 16th century. And this is what he said. He wrote, quote, Luther proved by the revelations of Daniel and St. John by the epistles of St. Paul, St. Peter, and St. Jude, that the reign of Antichrist predicted and described in the Bible was the papacy. Luther did it based upon the Bible. He did it based on Daniel and Paul and Revelation and First and Second John, and he saw it right there, and he took, he took a strong stand, and he was, willing, he was willing to die for this. And as a result of this uh, prophecy, especially in Daniel 7, there was a mass exodus out of the Church of Rome. Now here's a chart on the screen which is very important and it shows the basic sequence of Daniel 7 that we've already studied. There's Babylon, there's Persia, there's Greece, there's Rome, the breakdown of the Roman Empire, then there's that little horn and all of the Protestants said that was the church, the Roman church. They saw the prophecy successively fulfilled in history and on the top there of that slide it says this was called Protestant historicism. Protestant historicism, that was their, their doctrine of understanding prophecy, that they saw prophecy being fulfilled straight down in history. That is extremely important, important to understand. And again, because of this prophecy and other prophecies, there was a mass exodus out of the Church of Rome and a, a terrible breach took place uh, in Christianity in Europe because people were coming back to Jesus, back to the Bible, and preaching about the prophecies. This is exactly what happened. Well, some more history to tell you. The Roman Church reacted against the Protestant Reformation. And, and this was called the Counter-Reformation. And there's a lot of history behind this. You can read it in the history books. You can read it in the book End Time Delusions. There's, there's all kinds of books out there that talk about this. And what happened was the, 
the Roman church didn't like the fact that the Protestants were putting, pointing the finger at them and they said, we've got to do something. So they reacted in the counter-reformation and they had a major council that took place in the year 1545. It went on in uh, different sessions to the year 18, or, uh, 1563, an 18-year period, and it was called the Council of Trent, just north of Rome in Italy. And it was a very famous uh, Catholic council where the leaders came together to plan how to deal with the Protestant Reformation and with all the people that were leaving, leaving the church. At that council, there was one particular order that was set aside and given a specific assignment to counteract the preaching of the Protestants. They were to do this through open warfare, they were to do it through intrigue, and they were to do it through theology. Anybody know the name of that order? It was, uh, the longer version is the Society of Jesus, otherwise known as the Jesuits. And in the 1500s, in the Council of Trent, the Jesuits were commissioned by the Vatican to specifically develop counter theories to take the, the blame off of the Roman church. And so they went, they went to work. One particular Jesuit, his name was Francisco Ribera. He was a Jesuit from Spain, from Salamanca, Spain. He was a brilliant man, a doctor of, of the law and, and of studies. And he went to work on this. And there's a quote there from George Eldon Ladd, a very respected um, Protestant commentate, commentator. He's not alive anymore, but he wrote a book called The Blessed Hope, a biblical study of the second advent and the rapture in 1956. And there on, your, on the screen there, you can see a picture of Ribera's book and the quote there from Ladd, which says, in the year 1590, not long after the Council of Trent, Ribera published a commentary on the book of Revelation as a counter-interpretation to the prevailing view among Protestants, which identified the papacy with the Antichrist. And then Ribera said Antichrist would be a single evil person who would be received by the Jews and would build up Jerusalem. So Ribera studied the prophecies that Luther studied. He saw the lion, the bear, the leopard, the dragon, the ten horns, the little horn, and then what he said was that little horn applies to somebody that would come way down at the end of time, one super bad guy who would make war against the Jews. That was Ribera's uh, interpretation of the prophecies. And that view, theologically, became known as futurism. And there you can see our, our chart there. You see the lion, the bear, the leopard, the dragon, or the fourth beast. You see Babylon, Persia, Greece, and Rome. And what uh, Ribera said was that when Rome fell, there was a gap, the Jesuit gap. And then at the very end, that little horn would come up at the end, and he would be one man, one Mr. Sin, who would make war upon the Jews at the end. So the prophecy went on, and then it stopped. And then there's a big gap, and then it picks up at the end. That is the futurist view that was promoted by Francisco, Francisco Ribera. And the amazing fact is that that view has been popularized by Tim LaHaye and Jerry Jenkins in their best-selling series, Left Behind. Left Behind is, is really, uh, there's a lot involved in Left Behind, but, but one of the main uh, elements of this series is that it is simply a fictionalized version of this core element of Francisco Ribera's theology. That one man is the Antichrist, he comes at the end, and left behind, picked it up, and made it into a series of uh, very fast reading novels, which people are, are now reading, they're reading all over, all over the world. Novels and movies, but this is Ribera's theology. You can trace it. Uh, right back, right back there. Now, there is something else that has happened recently. I mentioned this, uh, and I believe it was our last program or two programs ago. This is amazing to discover, but there has been a reaction, there is a reaction now against left behind theology. Just like there was a reaction against the Roman church in the Protestant Reformation, and there was a reaction against the Protestant Reformation in the Counter-Reformation, and now there's, being, there's a reaction against left behind theology that is growing within the Christian church right now. I showed you this article in one of our previous programs. This issue of Time Magazine, this is today's issue, November 22nd, 2004. On page four, 
It says here on the, on the introduction that there is a brand new series challenging Left Behind. This is news, today's issue of time. And when you read it, there's the article up there. It shows Tim LaHaye there. This is on page 24. And it says, is it the end of the world as this author knows it? And it mentions Tyndale publishing a rival series challenging the premise that born-again Christians will be raptured into heaven while those left behind face the Antichrist during the apocalypse. And then it mentions the book called The Last Disciple by Hank Hanegraaff. And it argues that the book of Revelation describes the persecution of first century Christians under Nero, not some future tribulation of, of non-believers. I've got a copy here of that book. And there it is, right here. You can see it on the screen. Here's The Last Disciple. This just came out a couple of months ago. They've sold 50,000 50, copies in only six weeks, whereas Left Behind, the first book sold, um, I think it was 85,000 copies in a, in a year. So this book is not only rivaling, but it's outselling Left Behind. And I've read this cover to cover. Hank Hanegraaff and Sigmund Brower. Now what does this book teach about the Antichrist? This book teaches, and there's the quote on the screen, and I've read this, this is, this is a scene from where there's a group of Christians that are in prison, uh, in some little hut, they're chained to the wall, and Nero walks in, the Emperor Nero, and he has a, a servant with him, and this servant is threatening the Christians, and he tells them to bow down and to worship the beast. And that's a quote right there from The Last Disciple, page five, the Emperor Nero wishes for you to bow down and worship the beast. The theology of this book is that the beast and the little horn and the antichrist, it's not in the future. When is it? It's in the past. It was here a long, long time ago, 2,000 years ago, and this book says that, that the beast uh, was Nero. And that view, we've, we've looked at futurism, we've looked at historicism, that view technically is called preterism. And preterism coming from the prefix pre, meaning it happened in the past. So you've got preterism in the past, you've got futurism in the future. Now where did preterism come from? Where did this view come from that is reflected in the book The Last Disciple? Well, let me show you a quote here on the screen, and this is also in the book End Time Delusions. From G.S. Hicks, Hick, Hitchcock in his book, The Beast and the Little Horn, page seven. He said, quote, the futurist school founded by the Jesuit Ribera in 1591 looks for an antichrist Babylon and a rebuilt temple in Jerusalem at the end of the Christian dispensation. That's futurist, that's left behind. And then it says the preterist school founded by the Jesuit Alcazar in 614 explains the revelation by the fall of Jerusalem or by the fall of pagan Rome in 410 AD. When the counter-reformation commissioned the Jesuits to fight the Reformation, two different Jesuits went in two different directions. Ribera said it's all in the future, one man at the end. And then Alcazar, another Jesuit, said it's all in the past and the Antichrist is Nero. All in the past or all in the future? Those were the two views that came from Jesuit scholars in the counterfeit or in the counter-Reformation trying to take the eyes of men and women off of the Roman church. And what's happening right now, it's so phenomenal, in the battle of the books between left behind and the last disciple is we're seeing a battle between futurism and preterism. And both of those views, you can trace them as theories to counter the Reformation. They are anti-Protestant counter theories to take the eyes of people off of the Roman church. The same issue of Newsweek that talks about Left Behind and how phenomenally successful it is, I've got it right here, says on page 52, and I was just amazed to read that, I was so shocked, May 24, 2004, page 52, it brings out the truth right there. And this is for the whole world to see, this was this year. And it says here, quote, Martin Luther the reformer identified the Antichrist as the institution of the papacy. And that's right there in Newsweek. Isn't that shocking? And so really what's happening here is that now what's happening is there's a, there's a battle going on and the battle's been going on throughout history. It started in the early church, it's going on right now and it's gonna go on till the end of time and in the prophecy arena, there are three views now. There's the futurist view 
that's promoted by left behind. There's the preterist view that says it's all in the past. And then there's the historicist view of Luther and Calvin and Huss and Jerome and Wesley and Spurgeon and all the great Protestant reformers, many of them who are willing to die for their faith, saying that Antichrist is not behind us, it's not ahead of us. When is it? It's now. And it's a lot easier to write a book about a fictitious Antichrist in the future and a fictitious Antichrist in the past than it is to write a book about an Antichrist that is here today. Much easier. And I believe this is why these books are so popular. It's because they're describing things that don't relate to right now. Don't relate to right now. And we have to choose. We have to make a choice between which one. It is a fact of history that the Protestant Reformation has been derailed. You can see this slide there, a plane called Protestant Airways. Protestant Airways uh, changing course, and that's what Left Behind does, it goes this way. That's what the Last Disciple Preterism does, it goes that way, and they both have turned away from God's truth found in the book of Daniel and Revelation of Babylon, Persia, Greece, Rome, ten horns, little horn, with eyes like a man, a mouth speaking great things, making war on the saints. And what the book of Revelation says is that it will have a major, it'll be a major player in earth's final days. Earth's final days. And I see prophecy being fulfilled right in front of my eyes. I'm a Protestant. I believe in the Bible. I believe in Jesus. I believe in studying history. And I believe in putting all these pieces together. And I hope that this battle going on right now in the Christian world between futurism and preterism will open people's eyes to realize they need to study more deeply for themselves and they'll do this and study the Bible and they'll learn, they'll learn the truth. And I hope that the book End Time Delusions, which is right now in bookstores across the country, uh, the, it's in its third print run right now because people are reading it, their eyes are being opened and they're realizing, they're realizing what the Bible actually says and what the Protestant reformers believed that ultimately, above everything else, points to Jesus Christ, to his righteousness, to his truth, not just in his life, but in his prophecies, in his prophecies. That's what it's all about. The, the, the bottom line goal of the Reformation is to turn the eyes of people away from man to God, to Jesus Christ himself and to the Bible, away from the traditions and the doctrines and the opinions of men. We must never forget that when Jesus Christ came into this world, as the truth, what happened to the truth 2,000 years ago? The truth was crucified, and he was crucified by religious people, religious people, and may God help us not to follow the example of those that crucified Christ, but let's uh, accept him, receive him, receive him and accept his word and his truth and his prophecies so that we can understand what's going on around us, we can discern, and we can sense that God is preparing us for the final days, for the final crisis, so we can be ready for the second coming and for the end of the world.